Palestine. I came here for college, and uh, I go back every year. Uh, I'm from the West Bank. I think it's important to recognize the different territories, because occupation is not experienced the same way, right? So people in the West Bank haven't uh, been made refugees if they're from the West Bank, although there's internal displacement. So people in Gaza, 70 or more percent of them were displaced by the creation of the Zionist state of Israel. But it's important, let's say, in the West Bank that people learned from 1948 and they didn't leave thinking they would be able to come back, right? So my family, for example, stayed under a fig tree for two months and they would go and they would make food and then they would come back outside because they didn't want to get killed, but at the same time, they didn't want to leave. <clears throat> Um, these different relationships to land and to the dispossession create a colonial condition that becomes hard to then resist the occupation or the colonizer because not everyone experiences the colonization the same way. I say these things so we can relate to the struggle and try to uh, de-exceptionalize Palestine while retaining its specificity. It's important to think about Palestine as a site of struggle that's important for our collective liberation. And that when we stand in solidarity, that it's a strategic choice. Not out of pain, but out of desire. Okay? So, <clears throat> I guess what I'm gonna try to share, and I, I'm speaking, I'm trying to project, so I'm not speaking overconfidently, trust me. I'm just <laughs> trying to project, so it may be confused in that way. Because it's hard to talk about these things and I'm just thinking with you and thinking with the room, but I'm trying to encapsulate where I think what moment we're in and where we can go from here, which is a tall order. <clears throat> but I think October 7th was very important for Palestinians. <clears throat> because that date was a moment in which Palestinians in modern times chose not to co-sign on their death. See, the genocide never ended. And Oslo and these political processes and ways of talking about how the colonized needs to be civilized and somehow needs to agree, and if you put down your arms and you come together, then the people that screwed you over will give you something and you can live well. It shouldn't fool anyone. And this is where I want to kind of just pause and say about, of course there's a specificity to the struggle, there's the Jewish question and how Europe dealt with it and how it passed it on to the Palestinians and how Palestinian lives didn't matter, so they were invisible, and how out of hate they created Israel. Out of hate. And in the creation of Israel is an imperial project to serve larger political questions and power while mobilizing people around a religion in which they devalue what it stands for and then they create it to mean something that it was, it was marginal at best at that time, Zionism, amongst the Jewish community as a whole. But thinking about the creation of the state of Israel and separating it from you know, Jewish people and their aspirations of freedom and liberation and, and, and their identity is really important to then simultaneously think about the Palestinian question. Not as derivative of the Jewish question and how do we live together. And I think in these two questions of Palestinians and, and, and Jewish people is really a question that we're all trying to address today. Which is how do we live? How do we live when the states in which we belong to are carceral, in which governments don't represent people, in which the right to self-determination for all of us is being denied? Right. 
these questions are important in order to build power to create the worlds we want to inhabit. So I go back to October 7th and I say, what was special about October 7th? Is that Palestinians in Gaza, that decision to fight back, was against all odds. You don't think Palestinians knew what Israel would do to them? But every people that never resisted, they were bound to be erased. While simultaneously recognize that people can never be erased, because we're on stolen land. And we remind ourselves every day that we're on stolen land. And we remind ourselves every day that the people that they want to, even in your schools, they want you to re not realize how this country was built. I mean, Israel is modeled after the United States. I mean, it's, it, 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 this shouldn't be odd for us to recognize it. Who builds the settlement? There, Palestinians. Who built the wall? Palestinians. Why? Because they take their land. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they create carceral conditions in which the only thing they can do is sell their labor. Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about land back, what are you trying to do? You're trying to think about autonomy, sovereignty, being yourself and being with others and, in, and relating to each other in ways that they systematically don't allow it to happen. So then you go back to October 7th and you're like, what was going on there? People fought back. But you also know what that is. That's a refusal. That's a refusal in the face of colonial logic. But what that does is that it breaks the math about what does it mean to resist and how to live. This begins to point to the fact that the Palestinian struggle for liberation is an anti-colonial struggle that has been concealed through a political process for a very long time. And that has been concealed by the West, the hegemonic West, as a way to say Jewish people and anti-Semitism in the world is being dealt with over there. <laughs> and which is not true. Yiddish was actually not allowed to be spoken there. Arab, Arab Jews were not allowed to be Arab Jews. This begins to point to another thing that you should remember. The nation state is a fucked up project. Both the nation is a very, very, very violent act of inclusion and exclusion of minority and majority. And then the state, this, this abstract thing, that even when the Holocaust happened and Germany dealt with it, dealt with the Nazification of the thing through the Nuremberg trials, what did they do? They said the fucking state had rights, not the people that were hurt. So they never addressed the underlying thing of what happened. This abstraction of what we talk about in terms of rights and life and things, all of a sudden becomes, belongs to a state then controlled by corporate interests, and then controlled by a process of elections that never works, and all of, I don't, whatever it is, right? This becomes important for Palestine, because Palestine is not yet in existence in this community of nation states. And what's crazy about the Palestinian experience is that you have a Palestinian authority Palestinian authority that was chosen by the West, that right now steps on Palestinians' necks that are trying to resist, that actually inhabits a space in which it silences what otherwise would be a vocal voice on the international stage to point to what's happening in Gaza. And what they've done day in and day out since this has happened is arrest Palestinians, torture Palestinians, right? Do everything possible that Israel hasn't been able to do to Palestinians. It's important then to think, what does it mean to struggle, an anti-colonial struggle, and why is it important to think about Palestine as an anti-colonial struggle? You hear a lot about decolonization. 
they've been peddling it for a while now. I, you know, I'm in a group called Decolonize This Place, but you have to remember decolonization doesn't exist as a term in Arabic. <laughs> Just that should tell you a lot. The term in Arabic for what tries to get at that is liberation, to get free even. That's what it means. It means to get free. So the idea of decolonization, and you, if you read French and Fanon and all that kind of stuff, you'll get a better handle of it because the trans, it's in the translation. But the important thing about decolonization in the 50s and 60s, 70s, is that they made decolonization and freedom from, for colonized people synonymous with nation states. And then they chose who would govern. This is important for Palestine. That's why you have a, you know, a regressive Jordanian regime. That's why you have an Egyptian regressive Jordanian, you know, regressive regime. You have the same in Saudi Arabia. All of these people were chosen by the British. And they're still there. In Oman, keep naming it. That's what people said was, was, that's post-colonization, you know, or like, whatever. But we've never been out of that period. Right? Again, go back to Palestine. What's interesting about Palestine is like, without getting the nation state, they gave us a repressive regime. <laughs> Now, I point to the Palestinian Authority, but you can say in general, people at the top always screw people at the bottom. And that's why our movements need to be always close to the ground. Yeah. Then we say, okay, on October 7th, Again, why is it important to think of an anti-colonial struggle? Because in that period of people resisting their oppressor, everyone was clear what the violence was. The violence was structural. The condition perpetuated further violence. To then police the victim and have the victims police each other is bullshit, regardless of how it manifests. Because if we're trying to get rid of the violence, we're not trying to equate the violence on the abstract two sides of this thing. And notice, I'm not talking about Israelis, which is a manufactured identity. <laughs> or Jews, or Palestinians. I'm talking about oppression and structures, and how do we get free, and how do we build community. And I think that part of the ability to think this way with Palestine is to recognize that in struggle we construct a we. It doesn't happen based on an identity. I have much in common with the Palestinian and I have much difference with the Palestinian. And I may have more in common with someone that isn't a Palestinian about how to live and how to get free. And when we build together, we're recognizing debts we owe each other. Those debts here, for example, I owe debts to the people whose labor built this place. I owe debts to the people in which I'm standing on their land. I can't say I'm ready to free over there and not ready to free over here. It doesn't work that way. So bringing it back to Palestine, <clears throat> The important thing about October 7th was that we should not wait until we are eliminated. We should not wait until it gets so dire, right, that every single person dies next to us and we think, well, at least it's not me, at least we still have hope, at least I'm existing, existence is resistance. Don't buy it. We have to... I say we have to, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> but I hope it requires a lot of fearlessness. And it requires each other. And it requires a sense that when Palestine, the decision came out of Gaza to fight back, no matter the consequences, it was a call for each of us to figure out 
in a world in which they have made after COVID. Think about it. After every single movement we had. After every single thing we did. Take the streets. Do this thing. I don't know what and the other and the other. They told us, fuck off. It's foreclosed. This is how it's going to be, and this is how you have to accept it. Very similar to what was happening to Palestinians. And they fought back. This idea of fighting back, it's not about violence. This idea of fighting back is about refusal. When we refuse, we create the space. One, you know, like the Zabatistas say, one no can open up a million yeses. And when we, and then the other thing that was happening in Palestine is that that fight is so important right now and that's why you have two fleets going over there and that's why you have all, all the attention over there. Because they want to make an example out of Palestinians. Because shit, it's happening to the Armenians. It's happening in Congo. Genocides are happening everywhere right now. That's how they're going to solve the climate crisis. Oh, overpopulation? Done. We can't isolate these things. Of course, there's a specificity to what's happening. But in that specificity, we can't lose track of what we're trying to do, which is the 50s and 60s, where they tricked us into thinking in nation states you can get free is bullshit. They're more carceral than ever in surveillance, in extraction, in violence, all of it. If you look at how many people are invested in all the women's products that have to do with fertility and all this stuff, BlackRock, Vanguard. If you look at the five companies that are dropping shit on Gaza right now, and I'm not talking about the West Bank, but in West Bank is a genocide as we speak. In Gaza, five companies. Those five companies, BlackRock owns the largest investment share, 5 to 7%. And between BlackRock and Vanguard, 70% of the New York Stock Exchange. What the fuck? Like, it's not complicated, right? So then, our positions over here, our struggles are not only interconnected. The interconnectedness is a basis for how we fight back, for how we get free. We should never be stand in solidarity with each other because of how many babies get killed. I'm sorry. It breaks my heart. I see it all the time since October 7th. But that's not how you get free. That's how you relinquish your guilt. <laughs> so <clears throat> you go back to October 7th and you have to think, to, we have to think together. This place is a very important place for how this world is run. The people that are here are very afraid. When we, when we look at Palestine, it's opening up a crack for planetary struggle. They're not accepting that there is that everything is foreclosed. And this is, shouldn't surprise you. In Algeria, it took a million martyrs. Part of the willingness to want to live is being unafraid of dying. And this is not unique to the Palestinians. Just think of the enslaved on fucking ships revolting. What are you talking about? They fucking did it. They did it and they fucking went in the water. Because there's something about living in dignity, right? And on October 7th, settlers fled. So then what's the difference between a settler and a migrant? This is really important. It's not that, oh, well, Jewish people, they came and they wanted to live. And the Jewish people, they came and they wanted to replace. Mm -hmm. The people that come and want to replace, those are settlers. The people that come and want to coexist and live together, those are migrants. Mm -hmm. This tells you something about the political formation of who we're talking about, not an identity based on a religion or where they came from. So all these things, 
I don't know how I'm doing on time. I probably overpassed. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, <laughs> um, so, so then you know you heard Andrew Ross talk about water and this and that, and you heard about the natural resources and this and that, and I think that you know they're destroying refugee camps. So let's focus a little bit on refugee camps. Why are refugee camps so important for them to destroy? Because it so happens that the memory and the resistance and somehow the willingness to fight back comes out of difficult conditions. And the most difficult conditions are ones in refugee camps. They know they want to go back. They know they weren't supposed to be here. Versus, for example, I, with my other relatives and whatever, they're worried about whether they lose their house, but they haven't lost it yet. <laughs> They've lost other things, right? So when they're doing this in Gaza right now, they are, you know, it's not just enough to say that they're responding to what happened or they're coming out of some existential fear. These are tactics that are about terror that are about force, forcing people to leave, but it makes it seem to the rest of the world that it's by choice. Right? And in fact, it makes the people themselves think that it's by choice. And this is really important to the psychology of the colonizer winning. The colonizer knows that it's never, never going to win if it beats you to death, and it beats everyone that you know but it thinks it wins if you internalize <laughs> your death. It internalizes your loss. It internalizes that you can't win, right? So what they're doing right now in Gaza is trying to, it's a political tool. Genocide is a political tool. It's not an ethical position. It's a political tool. Every war is a political tool. The fact that it's brutal is just, operating on another level. But what they're trying to do is get Palestinians to internalize that they cannot win. And if they move, then they get all the land. Now this land isn't for Jews, I'm sorry. <laughs> this land is for a lot of other things that has to do with profit, that has to do with imperialism, that has to do with interests, geopolitical interests. So that's something also to keep in mind. When I said October 7th was important to Palestinians, because I was there for two and a half months in the summer, and I was talking to my friends who were in refugee camps, who were in different factions. Now, let me pause for a second. People, Hamas, 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 just like the PFLP, just like Fatah, just like any number of Palestinian factions, just like any colonial struggle that has had many factions. It has a charter from 2017, you can read it. From 2017, you could read it. If you want to think what kind of political organization and liberation struggle it is, read it. I go back and I say, did they do good things, bad things, whatever? My point, and you should remember this, the colonized is always forced to police each other and there is no perfect fucking victim. You're either on the side of the colonizer or the colonized. Yes. You don't want it to happen, deal with the bullshit. Mm -hmm. But it's important not to denounce groups because you fall into the trap of focusing on the colonized. Mm -hmm. It's a trick. Of course, no one wants anyone to get hurt. But we're not talking about relationships, we're talking about power. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the things that we can control, we're talking about conditions that exist and how we change them. Mm -hmm. It's also important to recognize when we talk about colonization and anti-colonial struggle, the problem Palestinians face, it's the same thing people in African nations face when they ask for repatriation of shit that was looted. It's like, where do you send it? 
right? The government is corrupt. I don't know what is happening. Colonized people don't have representation. <laughs> this is a problem. It's always existed. So how has the international community of states dealt with it? They often said, and this is, this is like, in, now this is international law, but it's important. They've often said that the resistance movements represent the people. The, the groups that are resisting represent the people. So that's why the PLO was chosen as a representative. Oh, they represent 22 factions. They're resisting Israel. They're doing it by arms. They're doing it diplomatically. They're whatever. This liberation struggle then becomes a government and they can rule over a people. The other way they did it is plebiscites. Do you want to stay with your colonizer or do you not want to stay with your colonizer? All of those ways don't work. This is how you end up with a Jordanian regime. This is how you end up with a king. This is how you end up with whatever. So I say that part of what's going on right now in Palestine and part of the, the difficulty is people are resisting but no one represents them and they can't be represented. And they want to be free and they want to be autonomous and they want to live but the only option they're given is a nation state. And so then you study and you think, oh, is it one? Is it two? Is it whatever? And you don't look at all the different experiences of the Kurdish people and how they tried to rule and govern. Or the Zabatistas and how they're trying to do. So there's things that are vertical and there's things that are horizontal. And I think part of the a way in which we have to think about how we struggle is also how we live. And this is where I'll say, I'll end. And these are just, you know, they're just things to think about and to think more about with each other. It's really important to act. It's really important to take direct action. Mm -hmm. It's really important to know that you have to be transgressive in what you do. That you're actually, every act is meaningful. That everything we do in life, we consent to the structures of power. Just like when you hop a turnstile, you're not consenting to be charged. There's ways in which those things of how you use your body and your spirit contributes to being free, to experiencing freedom, to know how to stand with other people who are trying to get free. Because as different conditions that we're all experiencing, we're all wanting the same thing, but we don't have the language for it, and we only figure it out together. And it's not by saying, here's a solution, and then here's how we get to it. It's about actually figuring out how we, co how we actually co-inhabit and do these things. And I say direct action because through action, we learn a different way of thinking. Through direct action, we act as if we're already free. When we act as if we're already free, we're training in the practice of freedom. Mm -hmm. This scares the shit out of them. The best thing we can do right now is think of ungovernability as a strategy. Mm -hmm. Let them figure it out. Yeah. But when you take the streets, when you break windows, when you care for each other, when money doesn't mean what they want it to mean, when you figure out how to set different values, when you know how to say to a Zionist, no, when you take a position even though you know it'll make your life a little bit more difficult, mm -hmm. trust me. It's worth it. It's worth it and it scares the shit out of them. Because the only reason they're governing is because they figured out how to make us hopeless and how to make us think that we don't have power. They have 35,000 police officers. We're 9 million here. The math is not difficult. <laughs> You don't think they would change their behavior if they knew that they were losing control? Dude, where do you think the phrase throwing people under the bus came from? It's what they did to the native people here. It's what they fucking do to everyone. This is why the settlers ran. 
They don't have the commitment that we have. Mm -hmm. An ethical commitment to living, mm -hmm. to the living, to the planet, to the whatever. So when you think of Palestine, do not exceptionalize it. But it is a strategic engagement. And it's important that we don't lose on Palestine. Because that's bringing us together and opening up a million fucking cracks. That's it.